This video was sponsored by KenHub. This is the brachial plexus, a twisting and intertwining bundle of nerves that communicates nervous signals from the brain to the arm and vice versa. It's one of the most complex structures you'll study in anatomy, but it's also one of the most elegant. And in this video, we're gonna make sense of it all. Hello and welcome. If you're new here, my name is Patrick, and this channel is all about anatomy and physiology. Here's the big picture. The brachial plexus is the bundle of nerves that innervates the upper limb. That's the brachial part of the brachial plexus. And the purpose of this complicated looking structure is to get nervous signals from the brain to your biceps or from your fingertips back to your brain and everything in between. All right, so what's our gross anatomy here? The first thing you need to know is that there are structures called spinal nerves that poke out between each vertebrae. I covered this in my plexus overview video, but each of those spinal nerves can transmit both sensory information and motor information. So they're what we call mixed nerves. Some of them will divide into strictly motor nerves or strictly sensory nerves more distally, but the spinal nerve itself is mixed. Then each spinal nerve branches into two rami, or ramus for singular, one anterior and one posterior, both of which are also mixed. And in general, the anterior ramus innervates more anterior structures around the level of the vertebrae, while the posterior ramus handles the posterior anatomy. This is more relevant in the trunk and abdomen, so don't worry about it too much for this video. The nerves that innervate the arm are all anterior rami, which are bundled into the brachial plexus. Specifically, we're talking about the anterior rami of spinal nerves C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. These run kind of lower neck to upper shoulders area. Now, how we name those nerves is a little weird. We name most spinal nerves in the neck based on the vertebrae below their exit from the spinal cord. I use the example of the flower being named after its flower pot. So the C5 spinal nerve root emerges superior to the C5 vertebra and so on. But we use a different naming convention for everything inferior to cervical vertebra seven. Thoracic spinal nerves are named for the vertebrae above their exit from the spinal cord. So spinal nerve T1 pokes out between the first and second thoracic vertebrae, spinal nerve T2 pokes out between the second and third vertebrae, and so on. That leaves the spinal nerve between C7 and T1 in kind of a no man's land. So we call it spinal nerve C8. If anyone knows the anatomist who came up with this naming convention, by the way, please email me. I would love to make a video about it. So if we look at the whole structure together, the plexus receives contributions from spinal nerves C5 through T1, but the brachial plexus also gets a little bit of input from a nub that branches off of the C4 spinal nerve and another from the T2 spinal nerve. So while those five main spinal nerves are the stars of the show, there are some supporting cast members. The plexus then runs down the neck, under the clavicle, through the armpit, and down the arm until it becomes the terminal branches which extend all the way to the wrist. And I emphasize this thing's gross anatomy because when students learn the brachial plexus, they tend to obsess over memorizing the diagram and lose sight of the fact that this is a three-dimensional structure. All of that said, we can finally tackle the plexus itself. When we look at the plexus as a whole, we organize it into different sections according to where different splits and unions occur. Because of that, I'm gonna teach the structure in smaller, more manageable chunks. The first grouping is made up of the roots. Each root branches off of the anterior rami of those spinal nerves that you're already familiar with, C5 through T1. The naming is easy enough root C5, root C6, etc. But you'll notice that the roots of C5, C6, and C7 feed into this long branch that looks like it drops straight down. That's the long thoracic nerve. And when we zoom out, we see that it drops inferiorly, kind of like a pair of suspenders. That nerve goes on to innervate the serratus anterior muscle, the muscle that protracts the shoulder blades forward. Branching off of each spinal root are some thin nerves that innervate some of the neck muscles, like the longus coli and the scalenes. We saw the same thin nerves in the cervical plexus too. Finally, for the root section, there's another little nerve that pops off of C5 called the dorsal scapular nerve. Dorsal is the directional term for back, and scapular is the regional term for shoulder blade, or scapula. So just like the name implies, the dorsal scapular nerve innervates a couple muscles on the back side of the scapula. In particular, the levator scapulae, rhomboid major, and rhomboid minor. Like I said, all of these insert on the back side of the scapula, so the name gives away the function. Back on the plexus, the roots merge into the next subdivision, the trunks. C5 and 6 merge into the superior trunk, C8 and T1 merge into the lower trunk, and C7 makes up the solitary middle trunk. At this point in the brachial plexus, we're heading away from the spinal column and towards the superficial neck. And this is where a solid understanding of gross anatomy comes in handy. When we study the neck, we can section it off into different triangles made by those long spindly muscles. 
The anterior and posterior triangles are the main ones, but there are smaller occipital and omoclavicular triangles within the posterior triangle. The proximal portion of the brachial plexus can be found in the occipital triangle. But once we transition from the roots of the brachial plexus into the trunks, the plexus pokes through a gap between the anterior scalene and middle scalene muscles in the omoclavicular triangle. This image shows that transition, but with the sternocleidomastoid muscle out of the way. But once we look at the trunks again, we notice that the superior trunk has two little branches that pop off of it. That's the suprascapular nerve, which heads to the shoulder blade, and the subclavian nerve, which heads to the clavicle, or collarbone. Remember, at this point, the brachial plexus is just starting to poke through the scalene muscles. So the scapula and clavicle are some of the closest structures that these nerves can plug into. And we can actually see some of the suprascapular nerve in our triangle view. And sure enough, it's heading inferiorly and posteriorly, directly to the scapula. Now, that suprascapular nerve runs from superior to posterior, and it kind of dips under the spine of the scapula before spreading out onto the posterior side. From there, it innervates the supraspinatus muscle, the muscle superior to the spine of the scap, and the infraspinatus, the muscle inferior to the spine of the scap. These are nice, intuitive muscle names. But you'll notice that the suprascapular nerve doesn't innervate the teres minor muscle, just the two superior most scapular muscles, hence suprascapular nerve. But this is still a mixed nerve, so we have to remember that it also handles sensory information for the nearby joints, the glenohumeral joint, or shoulder socket, and the acromioclavicular joint, or AC joint. The other branch off of the upper trunk, the subclavian nerve, is much easier to remember. It just innervates the subclavius muscle, which, as you could guess from the name, is the muscle under the clavicle. By the way, if you need help memorizing muscles, I've got a whole playlist for you that you can find here. Back on the plexus, we're now directly under the clavicle, which is where the trunks split into divisions. Each trunk divides into an anterior and posterior division, which all head towards the axillary region, or armpit. The nice thing about the divisions is that there aren't any smaller branches going rogue here, so you just need to remember the six divisions, all of which get intuitive names upper anterior and upper posterior, middle anterior and middle posterior, and lower anterior and lower posterior. Literally just combine the trunk and the division. Those divisions then intertwine and join other divisions to form the chords. We have the lateral chord, medial chord, and posterior chord. Those directional terms refer to the cord's position around a big blood vessel called the axillary artery, which is a nice reference point when you're dealing with 3D anatomy. Like on this anterior view, we see the axillary artery front and center, with the lateral cord and medial cord in full view. The posterior cord is kind of hiding behind the artery, so let's go a little bit deeper. The medial cord is just a continuation of the anterior division of the inferior trunk, so you just need to remember that the directional terms change. The lateral cord is made from the anterior division of the superior trunk and the anterior division of the middle trunk. Finally, the posterior cord is a big ol' merger of all the posterior divisions. It ends up innervating posterior structures like the scapula and back of the rib cage and posterior forearm, so now we're at a point where the brachial plexus is starting to specialize a bit. Now eventually, the cords will give way to the terminal branches, but each cord, medial, lateral, and posterior, also has muscular branches that we should cover first. The medial cord has three branches, the medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, and medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. But heads up, sometimes you'll see these last two written as the medial brachial cutaneous nerve and medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve. I'm gonna use both of those in this video. The medial pectoral nerve is just a motor nerve, and it branches off into nerves that eventually innervate a section of the pectoralis major muscle and the entirety of the pectoralis minor. Again, think about your gross anatomy. These cords are around the armpit, and this is a medial nerve branching off of the medial cord. The pecs are medial to the armpit, so this is one of the closest structures this nerve could possibly go to. Moving on to the next nerves, that word cutaneous just means that it innervates skin, so it's entirely sensory. From there, the nerve name uses traditional anatomy naming. So the medial brachial cutaneous nerve innervates the skin of the medial side of the upper arm while the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve innervates the medial forearm. In addition, their arrangement on the plexus gives you an easy way to keep them straight. 
The forearm is inferior to the arm, and the forearm nerve is inferior to the arm nerve on the diagram. Also, we're going to see two more sensory nerves of the forearm, the lateral cutaneous and posterior cutaneous nerves, but those branch off of the terminal branches more distally, which we'll get to in a second. The medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve is the odd one out that branches off of a cord. Moving on to the next one, the lateral cord gives rise to one and a half nerves. I'll explain. The first one is the lateral pectoral nerve, and just like the medial pectoral nerve, it mainly innervates the pectoralis major while innervating a little bit of the pec minor. Plus, notice how the lateral pec nerve innervates more of the inferior portion of the muscle while the medial pec nerve hits the superior portion of the muscle. The lateral cord also shares a piece of this weird, kind of adorable little structure that connects the medial pectoral nerve and the lateral pectoral nerve. It's called the ansa pectoralis. Ansa from the Latin word for handle, and it does kind of look like a weird little bucket handle. Scooting over to the backside of the arm, there are three separate nerves that branch off of the posterior cord. The upper or superior subscapular, the thoracodorsal nerve, and lower or inferior subscapular nerve. Both the superior and inferior subscapular nerves innervate the subscapularis muscle, that broad muscle on the anterior scapula. The superior nerve innervates the medial portion of the muscle, while the inferior nerve innervates the more lateral portion. I know I just threw a lot of directional terminology at you, so let's pause for a second. At this point, the plexus is oriented in this kind of diagonal position. So the superior branch is more medial and innervates more medial structures. Likewise, the inferior subscapular nerve is more lateral, so it innervates the more lateral portion of the subscapularis muscle. I wouldn't say it's intuitive, but it makes sense when you got the diagram in front of you. But making this all more difficult is the fact that we usually see images of this thing from an anterior view, which means the posterior cord is blocked by a bunch of blood vessels, so it does take some memorization to remember that these things pop off of the posterior cord. All right, so in between the subscapular nerves is the thoracodorsal nerve. Its name refers to the dorsum, or backside, of the thorax, and as you can see from this posterior view, that's exactly where it's heading. Specifically, the thoracodorsal nerve innervates the biggest muscle on the back of the thorax, the latissimus dorsi. But since it pops up between the subscapular nerves, it sometimes gets called the middle subscapular nerve. I prefer using thoracodorsal since it gives you more information about what it actually innervates and not just where it is. After the cords, the brachial plexus is almost done. Slightly inferior to the edge of the pectoralis minor, each cord splits into their terminal branches. The posterior cord splits into the radial nerve and axillary nerve, the lateral cord splits into the musculocutaneous nerve and half of the median nerve, and meanwhile, the medial cord splits into the ulnar nerve and the other half of the median nerve. We're gonna go down each one, but remember, these are the terminal branches of the plexus. They still divide further into more precise innervations. We'll start with the posterior cord of the brachial plexus, which divides into the axillary nerve and radial nerve. The axillary nerve is named after the axillary region, the armpit. It's a mixed nerve, innervating shoulder muscles like the deltoid, the teres minor, and the lateral head of the triceps brachii, but it also provides sensory information from the shoulder joint and from the skin around the shoulder. It's a pretty short nerve, so it doesn't branch out into many structures. That leaves us with one more, the biggest nerve in the upper limb, the radial nerve. Remember that this thing branches off of the posterior cord, so it's going to go down the posterior upper arm and innervate posterior muscles and skin. Also, its name, radial nerve, gives you a pretty good hint. It's going to veer towards the thumb side, or radial side, of the forearm. So all in all, when you think radial nerve, think of structures on the back side of the arm, but kind of creeping towards the thumb. For example, if you look at the radial nerve's muscular branches in the upper arm, you'll notice that they run to muscles like the triceps brachii, and conius, or brachioradialis, all posterior or posterolateral structures. Then those sensory branches, the posterior brachial cutaneous nerve, and lateral inferior cutaneous nerve, innervate the backside of the upper arm. And once the radial nerve crosses the elbow joint, it'll split into a deep branch that innervates some deep forearm muscles and a superficial branch, which are all sensory. It also gives off the posterior antebrachial cutaneous nerve, covering sensory input from the posterior forearm. By the way, I'm not expecting that you're going to write all these down. I'm glossing over these branches of the terminal branches because 
oh man, I mean, we could go deep down this rabbit hole, but I wanna stay relatively focused on the brachial plexus for this video. Coming back to the plexus, let's tackle the branches of the lateral cord. We'll start with the musculocutaneous nerve, which branches off from the lateral cord around the inferior edge of the pec minor muscle. We see that cutaneous nerve again, plus musculo, so the name implies that it's gonna innervate both muscle and skin, and it does. The musculo part of the musculocutaneous nerve first innervates a muscle called the coracobrachialis. Then it heads distally where it also innervates the brachialis and the biceps brachii. From there, it gives off a few branches innervating the humerus and elbow joints. Around the distal anterior humerus, the musculocutaneous nerve turns into the lateral antebrachial cutaneous nerve, which innervates the lateral skin of the forearm. Remember that we saw the posterior antebrachial nerve branching off the radial nerve and the medial one branching off of the medial cord. So now our trifecta is complete. Back to the brachial plexus. The medial cord already had some nerves split off, but around the armpit, it gave rise to the ulnar nerve and the other half of the median nerve. This one is like the boss level of the brachial plexus, so let's start with the simple one. The ulnar nerve splits off around the armpit and goes inferiorly down the forearm towards the ulna, the pinky side forearm bone. Eventually, it passes through a little groove in your elbow between the olecranon and medial epicondyle. It's actually so superficial that you can palpate it really easily. Don't press too hard though, because this is the same nerve that you press when you put your arm to sleep. It's the same thing as hitting your funny bone. It's that nerve. As it travels inferiorly, the ulnar nerve innervates a few medial muscles like the flexor carpi ulnaris and part of the flexor digitorum profundus. It also splits into a dorsal cutaneous branch, which innervates the skin on the backside of the ulnar side forearm, and the palmar cutaneous branch, which innervates skin on some of the palm. Okay, now we can tackle the median nerve. This setup is way more intuitive when you anchor yourself in anatomic position. Remember, the median nerve was formed by a union of the medial cord and lateral cord, and both of those cords split off from their respective anterior divisions. So the resulting median nerve is an anterior structure that innervates the anterior side of the forearm. All this time, the medial and lateral cords have been running parallel to the axillary artery, then they form this elegant union that keeps everything tucked together tightly. Like I said at the intro to the series, it's cable management, but for nerves. The median nerve is a long nerve that runs down the whole arm, through the carpal tunnel, and culminates at the palm. When people talk about carpal tunnel syndrome, they're referring to structures innervated by this nerve, like most of the forearm flexors, those big muscles on the anterior forearm. In the forearm, the median nerve branches off into muscular branches that innervate the pronator teres, palmaris longus, flexor carpi radialis, and flexor digitorum superficialis. It also splits into the anterior interosseous nerve, which, as the name implies, goes interosseous, or between bones. In this case, those bones are the ulna and radius. Finally, it goes distally, innervating all kinds of muscles in the hands and fingers. That could easily be a video by itself, though, and I still want to show you how to actually label the brachial plexus before I tell you about our sponsor. Like I showed you with the other plexus diagrams, start by identifying the bony landmarks, cervical vertebrae C5 through T2. Then you can label the spinal roots. But keep in mind that the naming convention changes inferior to C7. So you've got nerves C4, C5, 6, and 7 arising superior to the vertebrae they're named after. And meanwhile, T1 and T2 are named for the vertebrae they're inferior to. Then C8 is that misfit between the cervical and thoracic vertebrae. At this point, we'll label the different subdivisions. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches with the mnemonic RTDCB. Everyone's got their own version of this mnemonic, and mine is Read That Damn Cadaver Book. You can put your favorite mnemonic in the comments section and we'll upvote our favorites. We did the same thing with the cranial nerves video. Fortunately, I find that memorizing the different subdivisions is the hardest part of the brachial plexus quizzes, because from there, it's just a matter of matching directional terms to the section. Like, there's a superior, middle, and inferior trunk. Then each trunk has an anterior and posterior division. So anterior superior, posterior superior, anterior middle, posterior middle, anterior inferior, and posterior inferior. All those posterior divisions join up to become the posterior cord, then you can use the mnemonic I am small to remember that the inferior trunk's anterior division becomes the medial cord, and the superior and middle trunk's anterior divisions become the lateral cord. Each cord has a bunch of terminal branches, so I use another memorization trick that goes along with the original mnemonic of Read That Damn Cadaver Book. For the lateral cord, I use Let's Memorize Muscles, or LMM, 
for lateral pectoral nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, and median nerve. For the medial cord, I say practice by actually understanding muscles, or PBOM, to go from medial to lateral for medial pectoral nerve, medial brachial cutaneous nerve, medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve, ulnar nerve, and median nerve. Some teachers prefer the MMMUM mnemonic for this chord because they're using the medial prefix in front of everything, but since we're referring to the medial chord and the medial prefix applies to four of the five names, I don't personally find that one helpful. So PBOM, or practice by actually understanding muscles, is my preferred one. Finally, for the posterior chord, I use unlike the last anatomy readers, or UTLAR, going from proximal to distal for upper subscapular nerve, thoracodorsal nerve, lower subscapular nerve, axillary nerve, and radial nerve. All in all, it's kind of like a story. Read that damn cadaver book, let's memorize muscles, practice by actually understanding muscles, unlike the last anatomy readers. It's a little gimmicky, but hopefully it'll help you during a quiz. Just keep in mind that the long thoracic and dorsal scapular nerves branch off at the root level as well. Now, those are a lot of mnemonics to memorize. And if you want to get some practice applying those mnemonics before your test, then you need to check out KenHub. KenHub is an anatomy learning platform that I use all the time when writing and fact-checking these videos. They've got an enormous library of in-depth videos and articles about gross anatomy, histology, blood vessels, and everything else you'll learn in anatomy class. Almost all of the beautiful beautiful illustrations that you saw in this video came from KenHub's Atlas, which often comes with multiple angles and illustrations of each structure, as well as cadaver images and cross sections. In addition to their library of content, I love KenHub's quiz feature. They allow you to take different types of quizzes with varying difficulties, and they'll give you personalized feedback so you can figure out your weaknesses and quiz on just that material. You can also create your own custom quiz by selecting the structures and topics that you want to be quizzed on. You can use most of KenHub's features for free, but if you want full access to all their content and quizzes, and there's a lot of it, you can go to khub.me slash corporis for 10% off your subscription. They've also got a no questions asked seven day money back guarantee, so you can try out the premium version for seven days, and if you don't like it for whatever reason, you can get your money back. Thanks to KenHub for sponsoring this video. I've got more videos in the Plexus series in this playlist right here. I got some basics about the nervous system right here, crowdfunding right here, and my big dumb face for subscription right here. Thank you to all my patrons. Have fun, be good.